Hello, everybody. Okay, hi everybody and welcome to our very first inaugural conference um, for Neurodiverse Museum. People will be continuing to join, I think, throughout this first session. Um, there were an awful lot of people who booked on to the session. We had over 200. I suspect some people will want to just watch the recording and people will drop in and out throughout the day, which is absolutely fine, whatever works for you as well. Um, but as a result, you will see there's a lot of people in the room. Um, if you find it easier, you can change your view. So it's just speaker view. Um, so you can just see that one, um, one person who's speaking at the time. Um, please bear with us um, because there are a lot of people here. We'll do our best to manage everything and manage the tech. Um, any issues at all, please drop it into the chat. Um, so my first session um, this morning is to kind of introduce you all, go through some housekeeping, make sure that everybody's happy and content with what we're doing today. Um, and first of all, it is just brilliant to see everybody um, and to see how needed um, this kind of work is um, and that you're all here um, to, to move things along. And we're really excited at the Neurodiverse Museum to be able to deliver this. Um, we're currently not funded. We're um, working very much in a kind of voluntary capacity to make sure that this um, is progressed further. And we feel very passionately about it. And if you are able to share anything about today on uh, X, you can use the hashtag ND Museums 24, capital letters, ND and M and we'll drop that into the chat. Um, please do share. So just a bit of housekeeping first. Um, if everybody could remember to have their audio off, that would be amazing. Um, and then if you prefer not to be in vision, that is absolutely fine. Um, we are recording. So if at any stage you are on vision and you don't want to be, just take that off. Um, use the chat function, please, at any stage. You want to share anything, whether it be thoughts, whether it be questions for any of our speakers, whether it be anything that's um, an issue or that you need support on, just drop it into the chat. And also feel free to just introduce yourselves in there so that we can have a really clear understanding of the different people that are working in this area or wanting to work in this area. And very happy that you can then be able to discuss with each other and particularly if there's any kind of um, potential partnership or support opportunities in there. Um, we do also have closed captions on so you can just click the three buttons and use those um, if that is something that's useful for you. Um, obviously sometimes they don't show exactly what we're saying but I find them really useful and um, that functions there if you need or want it. So I first of all wanted to give a little bit of a background and introduction to the Neurodiverse Museum, what we do, why we do it, and how we've got to the stage we are now. Um, so I'm Justine Riley. I'm one of the directors of the Neurodiverse Museum, and um, Alison Childs and Saraya Hall are here today, who are the other directors of the Neurodiverse Museum. Um, and they're waving, um, and Saraya is here as well. They are in the background and will be delivering support as well, and Saraya will be presenting with me later on. Um, and really, the kind of background of where we've got to has been quite um, developmental over the last couple of years. I My day job is running another organisation called Sporting Heritage, and um, I'm also autistic um, myself. And as we were developing work, I was starting to realise that there wasn't an awful lot of support across the museum sector for neurodivergent people. And we started to do some work ourselves and got some funding from Art Fund to look at how could we develop that? How could we understand more what was happening? And what that demonstrated was 
that actually it wasn't just within the sport and heritage sector, but it was across museums and the cultural sector more generally, that there was a need for support and a need to kind of have a really clear progression of what should happen. Um, so after that project, we got some funding from the Steps to Sustainability Project, which is funded by the Heritage Fund. And that allowed us to develop the Neurodiverse Museum Network, which a lot of you might be involved in, where we're able to support and discuss with each other and develop um, a real kind of clear thinking of, of where we need to go in terms of neurodivergence going forward with museums. Um, and that project has allowed us also to create the Neurodiverse Museum as its own organisation. Um, so this is really our kind of starting point of saying, OK, we've we've now got some really clear ideas and now the conference will help us to push and progress, progress those further. Um, but all of it can only work with the rest of the sector. And we are so keen to work with as many different people as possible and to understand the work that's happening already, to bring that together, to share it and to shout about some of the brilliant work that's happening. And then also ensure that the museum sector properly start to ensure they're equitable for neurodivergent people. And that's a long term um, development rather than kind of knee jerk reaction. Um, so a little bit later, we'll go into the principles for museums and neurodiversity, which have been developed by the Neurodiverse Museum and the network um, and how they're there to support the sector um, and develop a real kind of clear understanding of how to do that and to support the sector to do it. So we'll look at that later, but the key focus is around three pillars. And those three pillars are across audience and audience access for museums. They're around ensuring that collections are representative um, and that neurodivergent people see themselves within collections and lived experience is very much central to that. And within workforce and volunteering um, and that those three things all need to be supported and looked at together rather than just a focus or a concentration on one particular area to ensure that um, museums are equitable for neurodivergent people. So the conference will explore all of those three pillars as we go through. Um, and we're trying to ensure that there's, at this stage, some case studies and some examples to help those discussions um, along. But at any stage, please drop information in. There'll be things we've missed. There'll be things we haven't had time to um, put into today's session, or there'll be bits of development that we really want to work on. And the more information that we get from everybody, the easier that makes our job in terms of the next um, the next steps. We also have another network meeting set up for later um, in June, I think, which we'll share information about later on. So first of all, I want to try and bear with us as we go through the tech, but I want to try and launch a poll because what we want to see is why everybody's here, why everybody wants to be part of this session today, kind of gather a bit of information so that it helps us to see, did we manage to deliver all of those things today and what else the sector need? And there'll be a few different sessions um, where we'll do that. After we've done this first poll, I'll then go through a brief agenda of what we're gonna look at today. So cross your fingers, everybody. See if it will launch. Okay. So hopefully you now have a very short um, screen in front of you that says conference starter poll. If you're able to answer those questions, that would be amazing. I will give you a couple of minutes. Ah, people are answering. This is good. Another 30 seconds, we're nearly all there. <laughs>
Okay. I'm just going to end the part. Oh, I can see something else. I'm going to wait. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to end the poll. There we go. Um, now, I will share the results with you later, where we look at, did we manage to achieve what we thought? Um, but the key things um, that are of interest for us is to work out you know, exactly where different people are and are we delivering what you need? Um, so that's absolutely amazing. Thank you so much um, for doing that for me. Um, so... To give you an idea of what we have coming up today, um, I wanted to give you a really quick overview. I know you have the agenda, but um, I thought it might be useful just to recap it. So um, Jill Lo um, Looms Kuhn will be giving us the keynote speech um, in the next couple of minutes. We're really excited to have Jill with us here today. Um, then Saraya and I will be discussing the principles of museums and neurodiversity. We'll then have a break. We're trying to make sure there's plenty of breaks throughout the day. Um, and please also take breaks whenever you need them. Then we'll have a selection of case studies, which help to bring together where some of the sector is at the moment and discuss some of the key issues around those three pillars. Um, we'll have another break, a Q&A session this afternoon, um, which is an opportunity to discuss with people with lived experience, from neurodivergence, um, where the museum sector are at the moment, what we feel we need to do going forward. We do have some questions already that have come in through social media, but if there's anything else that you want to ask during that session again, drop it into the chat, we'll do our best to cover it then. Um, another break, and then there'll be a breakout session, um, just a half an hour breakout session later today, where we will put people into small groups. You are welcome not to participate that, and stay in the main room or participate in different ways or just be within those groups. Um, and then we'll collect information again, probably through a poll. It's quite difficult to do it with a really big room. So we think that's probably gonna be the easiest way. Um, and then we'll have a short wrap up session and we've got an end of um, session survey as well to find out if we have managed to um, deliver what you need and what else we need to do, because this is going to be a long process with lots of development, developmental opportunities needed. So as we go through, before I introduce speakers, I will be putting up a slide for the recording so that we can um, make sure we can see all where the different um, sessions are. So I'm going to do that now, trying to make my brain work in the two different ways. It's very interesting. There we go. So um, our next um, session for the next half an hour is with our keynote speaker um, and a short Q&A. And this is Dr. Jill Leans Quinn. I'm going to let Jill um, introduce herself. Um, and I'm really excited to hear more about what um, what you're going to tell us, Jill, and how we can learn more about what, um, what we do from what you do. Um, and I will be off camera, um, but if at any stage you need me, I'm here. <laughs> thanks, Jill. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, and hello, everybody. Um, and thank you, Justine and Soraya and everyone um, behind the Neurodiverse Museum for inviting me to speak today. Um, it's hugely exciting, um, not least watching in the chat as everybody on the call is introducing themselves and seeing um, the vast breadth of experience and insight, not only from across the museum sector um, and the the range of, of museums and and um, cultural representation that is there, but also um, the amount of neurodivergent representation that is present in this meeting is quite fabulous. Um, brilliant to see in terms of representation and community building and um, brilliant for me as as an autistic speaker because um i have to say that like all of us i find these um these kinds of situation um not not the easiest particularly remote um particularly remote presentations and i think um having this neurodivergent um space uh, feels very safe and very welcoming and I'm incredibly grateful for that. Couple of um slight um apologies, caveats before I start my speaking, um before I start running my slides. Um, the first one is that I have my young cat in the room with me. It's a it's um uh a sort of one of the curveballs of working from home, I'm afraid. Um he's a bit on the lively side sometimes. 
um, has a tendency to do things like um, curl himself at windows and things. Um, I can't really do anything about that. If I put him out of the room, he's going to um, whinge, make his presence felt, um, and generally make a nuisance of himself in a much more distracting way. Um, I know some people find um, cat spotting, pet spotting in Zoom calls a bit of a bonus, as it says in the chat. Some people don't. And for those that don't, I do apologise. Um, also, like a lot of us at the moment, um, I am full of lurgy. And so apologies in advance for um, the nose blowing and whatever else happens, um, you know, cold wise. Um, can't help it. But um, with all of that, uh, with all of that um, said, um, yeah, I'm delighted to be here. And I am going to start um, sharing my slides. Um, so I am Jill Looms Quinn and I've worked in the field of, I'm an autistic person and I've worked in the field of autism advocacy for, um, roughly 20 years now. Um, and that means that a lot of what I'm talking about is going to be Right, you should be seeing my um my slides now. Um we can see them, Jill. Brilliant. Thanks, Justine. So um I've been working in the field of um of autism advocacy for, as I say, around uh, twenty years now, um, give or take. And um in terms of uh, individual um client crisis advocacy, um in terms of um, education, including in the higher education sector, working in, in the field of autism studies, and also in the development of um, peer support models and peer communities for autistic people, um, which is an area of work that I am incredibly passionate about. Um, I will say from the beginning that this means that when I talk from my experience, it means that I'm gonna sound very autism heavy um, of course, I acknowledge that today we are talking about neurodiversity, which is more than more than just autism. Um, it does tend to sometimes be mistakenly um, kind of um, used as a as a synonym for autism um, in a way that is, of course, problematic. And I don't mean to do that. It's just that that is where my experience comes from. That's where I speak from. And I'm incredibly keen to hear from other neurodivergent people with with other kind of diagnostic labels but but that's not where I speak from so what am I going to talk to us about today well I'm going to start by saying that I think I'm assuming that our purpose in coming together today is that we have um we have a, a range a huge diversity of experience of qualifications of expertise in terms of um of our uh, professional backgrounds um in terms of what we know about neurodiversity what we know about the museum sector and um the the sort of the cultural um, space that that occupies and the and the cultural work that that the sector does um and i think that we have i assume that we have kind of a shared vision in terms of um, wanting to make the sector um, more explicitly um, welcoming um, of neurodivergent people and representative of neurodivergence and of um, and acknowledging that as a society we are neurodiverse and that that should be represented in our culture and our social shared language. Um, I think that's probably what we're all trying to do. And what I am hopefully going to do is give us um, some the beginnings of some language of, of how we might articulate that um, in our in our advocacy work for this project, um, the different kinds of arguments that we might use, the different kinds of perspective that we might draw on. Um, so I'm going to do that by by addressing some of these issues that I've got on this summary slide here. So what do we mean by neurodiversity? I think this is going to be covered in a lot more depth um, further on during during the day today. But I just want to start by kind of summarizing and showing that actually the term neurodiversity has lots of different meanings, lots of different uses, um, and how we can sort of think about those in our own advocacy. Um, 
the socio-cultural importance of the museum sector. Now, I'm not going to I'm not going to dwell on that for too long because it's really not my area of expertise. And I think there are people on this call and people who will be speaking later today who are who are going to have um, a lot more insight into that. But I just want to kind of start by establishing that the museum sector is of socio-cultural importance in our in our society and our world and neurodivergent people have a right to see ourselves represented in that and to be able to access that space um so so i'm going to think about that i'm going to think about sort of why the new neurodiverse museum some of the different arguments that we might use um in advocating for our vision of a neurodiverse um a neurodivergent um museum sector um, and I'm going to think about what we mean by advocacy and advocating for the neurodiverse museum and at the end I'm going to give us some time to um, to commit um, to sort of three provocations to give us some thinking time um, in terms of what we can do as individuals and collectively um, and then I'm going to move on to some questions questions and answers um, so um, without further ado Let's move on. So as I say, this is a very brief summary. Um, the the field of neurodiversity is ever growing. In fact, it's growing kind of exponentially. Um, excitingly, I feel it's becoming um, not only a word, a concept, a theory, but also um, a movement um, and, and a politics. Um, and it's really kind of having its moment, uh, which is super exciting. Um, Judy Singer, who I'll talk about in a second, who, who coined the phrase, um, said that she felt that neurodiversity would be the um, the last great um, identity movement to come out of the 20th century. Um, and I think I think that's true, but I think it's the beginnings of the 21st century where it's really beginning to have its kind of cultural moment. Um, so we're living in exciting times, people, and we're really at the forefront um, among ourselves of this work, um, it's something we're part of, and I, for one, am incredibly excited about that. So, beginning to think about neurodiversity, first of all, it's a biological fact. Um, it's often described as, as a belief, a theory, um, an idea, but actually neurodiversity is, is simply a biological fact. The human species is neurologically diverse. And actually, it needs to be. That's that's kind of one of the ways in which evolution happens is through diversity. So really, in talking about neurodiversity, we're actually just really describing um, a biological characteristic of our species. Um, but beyond that, neurodiversity has become um, a paradigm, um, a, a, sort of a way of describing, um, uh, a way of kind of seeing the world and seeing it's it's become kind of a um a shift um as i say in the slide from a description of um characteristics such as my own sort of world of autism as mental pathology towards a kind of describing us as um subjects as as kind of a part of of society and um, as an identity an identity group um as you probably know, the term was coined by Judy Singer, who's an Australian sociologist and who wrote her um, BA uh, dissertation around 1997 on the term uh, neurodiversity. Um, the article that I link to in the in the slides is a Guardian article on Judy Singer, and it's a, it's a really interesting read to find out more about where she was coming from, kind of her history as a as a, a child of survivors of Holocaust and, and what that sort of taught her in terms of identity and how she saw neurodiversity as really being um, a political movement for, for people like herself and members of her family. Um, it's a growing interdisciplinary academic field. Um, so um, to quote from, from one of the, the sort of beginnings of one of the early sort of um, uh, authoritative textbooks on neurodiversity studies, um, it's a field that is working at the crossroads between sociology, critical psychology, medical humanities, critical disability studies and critical autism studies and sharing theoretical ground with critical race studies, 
critical queer studies. And we can really see there kind of a coming together of different disciplines, different social groups and um, different kind of political movements, which is something that I'll kind of reflect on when I think about, about the work of advocacy um, and how advocacy relates to what we're trying to do in terms of the Neurodivergent Museum. It's a coming together, uh, an inherently interdisciplinary and diverse field. Um, it's also a political movement, um, possibly first and foremost. It's concerned with identity work, with, with building a community together. Again, kind of a shared movement, um, a coming together of individuals who, um, who are kind of finding each other and sharing experiences and building a kind of a momentum, building a language to describe our experiences. Um, one of the aspects of work that I'm involved in now is providing one-to-one um, -one, uh, peer support um, for adults who have been recently diagnosed with autism. And the conversations that I have with people, with my clients, routinely talk about um, people feeling individuals, feeling a sense of uh, not uh, not fitting in, of, of not kind of understanding their sort of place in the world. And then with their recognition and their diagnosis of, of autism, kind of finding a shared community and finding a language to articulate their experiences and learning that they're not alone. Um, it's, a, it's a process that is discussed by Nancy Bagatelle in, in the article that I, I linked to there, which is a case study of one young man who is who is diagnosed and goes through that identity process um the the building of of the political movement of a community and a shared language is is a huge part of, of what neurodiversity means um it's also been a concept that has been has been challenged um so the ortega article that i linked to from 2009 points out that there's perhaps a danger of um of the language of neurodiversity kind of replacing what it um replacing what what it what it um came after the idea of of kind of um the sort of the mental pathology the the psychologization um the pathologization of um different uh neurological um different kind of ways of being different identities um and replacing that with simply a kind of a um a cerebral understanding a way that kind of reduces people to their cerebral characteristics their their sort of neurological um identities um to the exclusion of of kind of their other identities of the other aspects of what makes of what makes a person a person um so it's been kind of criticized in that way um but all of this to say that neurodiversity is a is a multifaceted um, phenomenon. It's a growing phenomenon. Um, it's a it's a paradigm. It's a political movement. Um, it's something. It's work that we are all involved in, um, and it's exciting. So moving on, um, this is this is my kind of two penneth, if you like. This is how I describe. Um, the the politics of neurodiversity so as i say that the work that i see us as involved in and i say that the politics of neurodiversity is not about arguing for um the place of neurodivergence within the physical and social boundaries of the status quo it is the work of presenting a radical challenge to these boundaries not begging for room at the table but a full-on elbows out battle to shift the furniture and to make room it's a bold human assertion of a claim for space. It necessarily disrupts things. Um, it's not about fitting us as autistic or other neurodivergent people into the world as it currently is, um, begging for a place, arguing for our um, legitimacy and our similarity to the neurological, to the, to the neurotypical majority. Um, it's about shifting that status quo and representing the diversity um, of uh, the, the the human species and, and the world that we live in. Um, and obviously that includes um, the, the museum sector, museums as cultural places. Um, so the museum sector, the museum sector is 
a part of our social world. It occupies a cultural place in our world. And as such, it's a place that neurodivergent people have a right to see ourselves um, represented in and to to have a place in to be able to access. Um, it's a sector that receives huge public investment. Um, 407.2 million pounds was awarded to museums by the Heritage Fund between 2015 and 2023. Almost 51 million pounds of um, public money um, over this eight year period. That is a lot of money. Um, Arts Council England invested more than five hundred and twenty one million pounds across um across aspects of the sector on average sixty five point one million pounds per year um and the department for the government department for culture media and sport um has also invested huge amounts in grants there so it's it it it's a lot of public money and and neurodivergent people are members of that public we contribute in terms of of our taxes and the work that we do. Um, so we're involved in that too. Um, the museum sector is used by millions and millions of people um, every year, 12.5 million visits um, to DCS, um, um, DCMS sponsored museums and galleries uh, in 2023. Although that's been um, impacted by, by the pandemic in recent years, that's still a lot of people who who are using the sector, and neurodivergent people have a right to be involved in that too. Um, and yeah, there's lots of revenue. There's revenue that comes from the museum sector as well. It's a part of the economy. Um, it's a part of the of the the social fabric of the world that we live in. Um, and my main point here is that neurodivergent people have a right to be part of that. We contribute. And we have a right to see ourselves represented and to be able to partake of this aspect of our social and, and, and cultural world. Um so some of the thoughts, some thoughts of mine. Um, I think these are the things that you're going to be discussing yourselves today um, about why the neurodiverse museum. And when I put together this slide, I was thinking in terms of arguments that we might use in our advocacy for a neurodiverse museum. Um, these arguments are different types of argument. They come from um, different, um, different subjectivities, different, um, different backgrounds. Some are human rights based arguments, some are legal arguments, um, some are um, arguments in terms of um, uh, the kind of economic and social value of involving neurodivergent people um in in the world in particularly in this instance in, in the um in the neurodiverse in the museum sector um when i come to talk about advocacy shortly i'll i'll sort of describe how um part of part of our advocacy needs to be understanding our audience and understanding where they're coming from and kind of tailoring our arguments um to to be most effective with our audience so i've kind of structured um my thinking across the three strands um that the neurodiverse museum um is concerned with that, that justine outlined um in her introduction um so thinking in terms of the workforce and by that of course i i include the masses of volunteers who are involved um, in the museum sector, in the work in museums, um, several of whom I've seen are on today's call. Um, so firstly, there are legal responsibilities for employers um, to, um, to make reasonable adjustments um, for neurodivergent employees in the workplace. And those are arguments that we can and, and should kind of employ in terms of um, how individuals um, go about making um, being being um included in the workplace um also when we're making um adjustments for employees often there'll be parallels with with the um, accessibility measures that should be made for for visitors and customers i think one of the things about these three strands is that they are interlinked and interlinked sorry and if we um make uh, improvements for one 
it's going to have a spin off into the other areas. Um, um, increased productivity is is the kind of argument that is often used when kind of trying to sell um, the role of neurodivergent employees um, in the workplace. Um, that's one that obviously comes with its its fair share of um, of kind of problems. But it's an argument that can be used in certain instances um, to to some effect. Um, neurodivergent people make a cultural contribution, and this includes to the workforce. Um, if museums are concerned with being representative of, of neurodivergence in their collections and in the way that they um, design themselves, then neurodivergent employees can make a, a contribution to that. Um, through the lived experience. Um, also, many um, neurodivergent employees in the museum sector are drawing on their own often lifelong special interests in the, the kind of subjects that the museum engages with. Um, and that brings a particular depth and passion to their work, um, which can be fostered to great effect. Um, so moving on, in terms of the collections, in terms of seeing representation, um, and neurodiversity in collections. This could this should be seen as part of wider neurodivergent citizenship. Um, we um, we should be seeing ourselves represented and and be able to identify ourselves um, in in what we see in museums as neurodivergent people. Too often, one of the greatest um, one of the great struggles that many of us have had um, as neurodivergent people has been in not seeing ourselves represented, not not having a sense of um, shared experience, not knowing where our place is within society. This is something that the museum sector can really work and contribute to, to tackling. Um, and that in itself doesn't just benefit neurodivergent people. It brings an added um, sociological and anthropological nuance and richness to, to the work of the museum itself. It's it's simply better scholarship. It's more, uh, it's more nuanced and, and richer scholarship. Um, there's um, there's an importance I feel of the the nonverbal of the the kind of the object, um, the tactile, the the um, the 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 concrete nature of of a lot of um museum collections that that can really I think be be kind of developed for. Um, for engaging with members of uh, the, of neurodivergent communities who don't perhaps communicate verbally, I think that's a that's a massive area of kind of social inclusion that could be developed. Um, and also it's a it's a way of um in, including neurodivergence and representing neurodivergence in um collections is a way of building dialogue with other socio-political minorities that are themselves beginning to be represented in museums and other social spaces. I think it's important where there is um, also where there is not maybe a collection where there's not um, where there's not that that um, that fabric to be to be included in collections that that in itself that absence is made explicit um, as a as a kind of representation of um of where neurodivergent people have historically not been acknowledged through um in different areas of society i'm aware that i am um that i am i only have a couple of uh minutes remaining before we can have a few minutes for the questions and answers so i'm going to leave that slide there and i'm going to move on to thinking about advocacy the work that we are doing um what we're here to discuss and to begin is a form of advocacy, um, advocacy in the sense of um, taking action to create change and speaking truth to power. Museums themselves can be seen as locations of advocacy and representation, um, of social advocacy that is concerned with the representation of, of minorities. And as such, I think as people who are concerned with neurodiversity and the neurodiversity movement, we are standing on the shoulders of giants of other um, social and political minorities who have done this work um, before us. Um, in terms of how we go about that, I think one of the things that um, 
one of the things that I have learned sometimes the hard way has been um, about, as I said before, tailoring my arguments um, to my audience. I think that's where conversations like today are incredibly important because we begin to learn the language of other people you are working with. Maybe people who come from different backgrounds, who maybe we might assume knowledge that, that maybe is, is lacking that we can then share. We can um, kind of uh, find sort of meetings of the mind and com common ground. Um, sometimes we might need to argue um, from a place that might not necessarily be um, be our our kind of what we feel like is our comfortable ground. Um, I included the case there, Brown against Board of Education, which is the famous um, American um, court case that that um, desegregated uh, American public schools, which would be seen as a as a kind of a, a step in terms of social justice and human rights but was actually decided on the basis um, of evidence of the psychological harm that segregation um, was found to do um, to, to black children that, um, and to children of color. And that might not seem like the most, um, the most kind of morally and ethically um, powerful argument, but it was an, an argument that had power in terms of, um, in terms of the, the, the people that were, um, that were involved in the actual process of desegregation. So it was an argument that was used. Um, also in terms of advocacy, we, we need to, part of the work that we are doing now in standing on the so shoulders of giants is building our own language. Um, it, was, it was part of what Judy Singer saw as kind of integral to coining the phrase neurodiversity. Um, she hoped she might somehow speed up the growth of neurodiversity into something unstoppable. She said, we need an umbrella term for the movement. We need a language to be able to, to advocate for ourselves as a movement. And that's what I think work like today is doing. Um, I am aware that I am running out of time. So um, I think I'll just conclude by thinking that um, the work of advocacy is often complex. Um, it often involves aiming for the stars um, in order that if we miss, we'll reach the moon. If we aim for the moon, uh, if we miss, we'll land on the floor. So we need to be aiming for the stars. But at the same time, we need to be pragmatic. We need to recognize that sometimes the perfect is the enemy of the good. Um, sometimes we're offered, um, as, as neurodivergent people, we're offered measures such as quiet hours or, or separate hours um access to to social spaces which might seem like half measures might seem like not full inclusion and obviously it's not we want not what we want um as as kind of our end goal but it might be a step in the right direction and it might be something that we that we can foster rather than taking the rather than kind of aiming for the perfect and um, that being the enemy of the good. Um, yeah, I think I'm going to leave that there. Um, hopefully, I mean, this is something that I could talk about a lot as as um, I'm super passionate about advocacy, but I'm going to end with three provocations, um, things, questions for you to answer. Um, so what can you do in terms of your own advocacy for the Neurodiverse Museum? Firstly, to embed neurodiversity in your own practice. Secondly, to embed neurodiversity in your organisation. And thirdly, to embed neurodiversity across the sector as a whole. Um, I'm sorry that was rather rushed, but I will leave that there. Thank you, Justine. Oh, thank you so much, Jill. I mean, there's just so much to discuss and some of the things that you talked about there and some of the quotes that you gave we're really passionate and fitted so much with what we're trying to achieve. And I really love that you outlined the kind of investment that goes into the sector. And I th suspect if we then looked at how that is reflected across the specific investment that goes in for neurodivergent audiences, workforce and representation, it would be, you wouldn't even see it, it'd be infinitesimal. So, um, 
and that's something that we are definitely trying to work on so it's amazing to hear you speak and about what we can do and how we can shift and change things and i think our session in a moment the principles might help to carry on with the bit that you were just discussing and looking at um we're going to shorten our session a little bit we wanted to just see if anybody had any quick questions now jill will be with us later on um for the q a as well but if there was anything anyone wanted to drop in i would take one question it's fine if not i'm just going back to look i think you might be all right jill until this afternoon <laughs> thank you so much um i'll do the round of applause myself <laughs> um and yes the recording will be available later on um and we will share some of the links jill in your slide um with our email that goes out um afterwards thanks so thank you so much um I'm going to do a very quick, as I said, I would slide share before the next session. Um, and this is to support the recording. So our next session is looking at the principles for museums and neurodiversity. Um, and this is um, work that the museums um, and all of the various different people that have been working with us in the network have been developing around how do we properly support the sector to change. Um, I'm just going to share my presentation um, for this session. Bear with us. I've been watching Miranda too much recently. Um, okay. And um, I'm just going to... Okay, now I'm gonna ask you, um, and Saraya or Al, let me know. Can you see my speaker view or can you just see the slides? I can see your speaker view, Justine, it's fine. Here we go. <laughs> Here we go, everybody. Better? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, you're... brilliant. <laughs> Thanks, Al. Um, so for the next, um, I'm going to keep an eye on time. We are going to have a break at quarter past 11. So for the next um, 20, 25 minutes, we're just going to have a quick look at the principles for museums and neurodiversity. Some of you may have seen these before. We launched these a couple of months ago. Um, they were a cul culmination of pulling together lots of different information that kind of is based on the work that Jill has just been talking about. That's looking at how do we make sure that we're properly discussing how the sector can change and shift for neurodivergent audiences but but rather than doing that in a kind of oh museums aren't doing what we need we need to we, you know they're not doing a good enough job but actually looking at it proactively and sensibly and thinking about well how do we make that change happen how do we support that what are the training needs for museums what are the skills and development needs that museums need to think about so that it's a properly supportive process that helps real organizational change happen um, rather than just what can sometimes happen within the museum sector where we get really interested in a specific kind of area of work we do some really intensive work for a year or two and then that's forgotten we want to make sure that this activity is embedded within museums and that it is seen as just something naturally and part of what museums do and the principles for museums and neurodiversity are very much part of that so um this is a presentation between me um, and Soraya, um, and I can't see my speaker view now. So Soraya, if at any point I just keep going on and I shouldn't be, pop up in my screen and <laughs> tell me that um, I need to stop. Um, so what we're going to be covering today, we're going to be looking at what the resource is, what, is, what are the principles for museums and neurodiversity, we touch a little bit on what is neurodiversity and what does it mean to be neurodivergent. Jill's covered some of that already. Um, and it's something that we always just keep coming back to. Every time we run network meetings, we're asked to just re reiterate that at the beginning to support anybody that isn't comfortable with the terminology, that isn't aware of how that works. Um, and just to keep remembering what we mean by that. Um, then what do we mean by adopting the principles? What what does that actually mean to become an organization who thinks that these are important and they're going to embed them? And then a quick look at the five different principles. And we will be sharing the slides and access to the principles afterwards. So what the resource is. Now, I'm pretty sure, Saray, that this is you. 
<laughs> but I can't see you in my screen to so let me know whether it is or not. On my notes, it's you. Okay, I'm going to carry on talking, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, the digital resource is on our website. You can download it. It's got very clear information. And what it does is try and support organizations from a kind of baseline of what it is to be a neurodivergent friendly organization to a kind of what's next. So what we're trying to do is not make this be a really intimidating resource. It's something that every organization can look at and think, actually, we could do that. We can implement these uh, very early stage activities. And then also museums who are maybe a bit further on who are thinking actually we could do more than that can start to progress to the next kind of stages. Um, it was created by the Neurodiversity Museum working with um, the museums and neurodiversity network and the input and support from all of the different organizations and individuals that were part of that network was amazing. And it's probably, it's difficult to be really sure, but it's um, probably half and half people who are neurodivergent and people who are working within the sector or linked to the sector who want to see this change happen. Um, and it's very much around producing these guidelines that help to inform the development of practice. Um, we use the term equity, um, and as you can see, neuro inclusion rather than just inclusion. We, we feel that the term inclusion has sometimes allowed um, some of the things that Jill was talking about earlier. Um, we'll do a quiet hour and that'll be brilliant. On the face of it, it seems okay, but actually, is that what neurodivergent people find makes a museum accessible? Does it actually further exclude neurodivergent people? Because that quiet hour is probably not going to be quiet. A lot of neurodivergent people, they particularly do not like a very, very quiet space. They prefer some kind of noise. Um, and is it actually saying, well, you can use our space during this time, but the rest of the time, it's not accessible to you. And that's not really what we're looking for. We're looking for equity, that kind of consideration of how do we ensure that across those three pillars, workforce, access and representation, we're thinking about that equitable approach. So the um, the principles are all rooted within that. Um, so what does what is neurodiversity? What does it mean to be neurodivergent? Um, so yeah, approximately, I know we asked you right at the beginning, how many people do you, you think what is in the population in terms of neurodivergent people? And the estimate at the moment is it's approximately one in five. It's likely to be more. Um, there is so limited research um, in terms of neurodivergence. And uh, until recently, a lot of um, people that were actually looking at neurodivergence were not neurodivergent themselves. That shifting and changing, um, and some of the work that people like Jill are doing is, is brilliant and starting to really inform how do we um, properly ensure we understand neurodivergence in society and change things. Um, Jill described it a little bit for us earlier on. It's that natural um, brains, you know, the, it's, it's, part of, it's part of humanity. Brains work differently. And then neurodivergent describes individuals. Um, and there are very many different terms um, that support neurodivergent um, terminology. Some of them are listed there. It's not all different, all the different types of um, terms that are in there. And often there's a lot of intersectionality um, within neurodivergence. Um, and that's really important to understand. Um, I'm conscious that there, because I'm autistic, there's lots of focus on, um, for me, that's the way that my brain works thinking about had a museum support autistic people, but I also have lots of people within my wider circle who are multiple neurodivergent or different neurodivergent. I'm always thinking, how do we ensure that we make, we're really thinking about all those different areas. I don't think, for example, we properly consider how do we support dyslexic people within the museum sector, but actually that could be something that's a lot easier to think about. It, we need to be really good at starting to recognize if we're going to use the term neurodivergent, that that's what we're talking about. And it isn't talking just about one or two areas. And that's something that as an organization, we want to shift that forward and why we're hoping to try and um, draw in additional funding so that we can make that happen. So this is definitely Soraya. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to hand over to you, Soraya. Yeah. Um, so yeah, this will 
go back to some of the things that Jill and Justine have already spoken about. Um, so before we go over specifically what each principle actually is, what do we mean by adopting them? What does that look like? Um, well, it's important to preface that adopting the principles oh, is going so <laughs> going to look different for every organization and that it's primarily about underpinning the thinking behind them uh, in your development. So it's about practicing intersectionality. So having that awareness that many people excluded from the museum sector because they're people of color, they're from the LGBTQ plus community, they're from working class communities or they're dis disabled, for example, can be and are also neurodivergent people. Um, and to reflect the diverse nature and experiences of the neurodivergent community, it's key to acknowledge and include these groups. And those things are also key in avoiding tokenism. Um, in terms of equity versus inclusion and why we use that in the principles, we use um, equitable to establish that the work needed to be done must be fair and not discriminatory or ill-informed. We feel that activity and work in the sector um, that has been branded as inclusive has far too often been harmful and misguided and um, misses that lived experience voice, um, which is important in you know, underpinning um, the thinking behind the principles. Um, giving stuff a go is super important. So if you try something and it isn't perfect, you can learn from it and grow. Um, but you can't if you do nothing at all or you don't try anything. If we're all collectively trying things out, we can help one another. And this is part of why the network exists. Um, you'll likely hear more about this later with um, our case study speakers, but underpinning this work will benefit everyone. Um, it's been proven that changes made to support neurodivergent people positively impact the majority, um, creating environments in which people feel supported, understood, um, and spaces in which allow for flexibility and effective transparent communication um, will help everyone to thrive. Um, and going back to, slightly back to intersectionality, um, neurodivergent people who face barriers to diagnosis, um, or those who simply don't want one, or individuals who are unaware of their divergency, or who feel uncomfortable identifying as such. Um, they, if we begin to underpin this work and make um, a approach change holistically, those individuals also get to be supported where they otherwise may not be. Um, I think I'll pass on to Justine to go into the first principle. Thanks, Soraya. Yeah, just echoing that, I think it's something that we've come across quite a lot in terms of that um, understanding anticipatory adjustments and making sure that um, that's something that we just do because it benefits everybody. Um, and it means people don't have to disclose the diagnosis or don't have to know their neurodivergence to be able to be supported. Um, and it is, again, something which underpins uh, how the principles work. So the first principle is very much around understanding neurodiversity and what it means to be neurodivergent. Um, we have found that um, there is a lot of need across the sector and wider. You'd be amazed the amount of people that are asking us to support or deliver training um, that have nothing to do with museums um, or the cultural sector, but really want to better understand the terminology, lived experience, how to properly consult and understand with um, neurodivergent audiences. So this is a key principle to what we're doing, but it seems to be a key principle to what a lot of different organisations and sectors are trying to think about at the moment. So 
the things that we really focus on are is there a way to use language and learning resources that have been created already that can support your work that are coming from the neurodivergent community that are from neurodivergent voice um so that you can be sure that that is really clear lived experience um and it's really important that that happens because we still see that there is a potential um issue around consultation happening with people who aren't neurodivergent but informing neurodivergent activity um so potentially non-neurodivergent parents of neurodivergent children um clinicians professionals and practitioners who might have a great deal of experience which is also valid but it isn't the same as neurodivergent um voice um, and then could you better understand the context behind the social model of neuro of disability um, and where neurodivergence fits within that? So we work on the social model of, of disability and that the barriers are not the people themselves, the barriers are what society is doing. So in this context, it's how museums are operating and how we can shift and change that. Um, and then can you continue what you're doing now? With the conference museum um, neurodiversity network how that can support you and how that can help you going further to understand more about what other organizations are doing um, and to understand how you can shift and support your organization and your individual practice in that way um, so on to principle two Soraya is this me or you I'm going to keep going. So, Prince. Ah, it's mine. Sorry, <laughs> I was on mute. <laughs> uh, right. <laughs> um, so, principle two, which is value neurodivergent individuals lived experience and neurodivergent voice, um, which Justine has gone into a bit, focuses on how you approach working with and involving neurodivergent people in activity and development, and not only recognizing the unique skills and expertise that these people have and bring to museums and our work, but valuing them fairly. So it focuses on adopting a nothing about us without us approach. Um, and nothing about us without us communicates that no policy, work or action should be decided or developed without the direct inclusion and participation of those who will be affected, represented or engaged by that policy worker action. It communicates the need and importance of self-advocacy and lived experience voice in leading change to ensure that uh, equitable, dynamic, supportive and relevant work is being done while avoiding the exploitation of those involved, which does happen um, and is happen happening across our sector. Um, so it's about thinking on how you build relationships and partnerships with the neurodivergent community. The neurodivergent individuals in your organization and community are ideally positioned to inform your development and practice. Um, and sometimes we can be eager to do so, um, but we need to be careful in the ways we coordinate that to ensure that it's fair and that the work being, that is being asked to be done is reasonable in accordance with its uh, compensation, whatever that may or may not be. Um, so that's thinking about the emotional, physical and mental labor neurodivergent individu uh, individuals put into support development and how often with other specialized topics, this kind of work is considered consultant consultancy, which would be paid accordingly. Um, but it's often not. Um, yeah, so it's about thinking about how you do that as an organization and what ways you might be able to compensate individuals. Um, it could be simple things, um, but it'll look different for every organization. Finally, it's about acknowledging what um, that assumptions can do more harm than good and that neurodivergent needs are and wants are varied and to understand them and make it easier for everyone. It's best not to exclude our voices. Um, so can you begin breaking down those assumptions in your work and then identifying them? Um, this resource that is on the screen um, 
can help you identify what good practice for autism organizations might look like. Um, this is something you can revisit there, uh, um, but as we've already gone into, not all neurodivergent people are autistic and where resources are lacking for autistic adults, they are very high, hard to find or just don't exist for many other neuro minorities that fit, un fit under the neurodivergent umbrella, which is why, again, it's so important to encourage and support the inclusion of those with lived experience in steering you. And I'm also doing principle uh, three. So principle three is create equitable access Rep uh, and representation for diverse neurodivergent audiences and participants. So it focuses on how we develop the accessibility of our spaces, including the content of our galleries and exhibitions by looking at connect uh, collections, uh, present and future, and also our interpretation. Um, working towards neurodivergent visibility and representation in each of those. It's also about acknowledging that everyone deserves to access, participate in and enjoy culture and heritage as a human right and being humans, that includes neurodivergent people. So thinking on, um, beginning to consider a range of different access needs like physical and functional access, which includes sensory, neurological and emotional access and considering how you can begin to meet those, which it might look like many things with readability, thinking about contracts and text size and sentence structures, things like that with your website. Can you include more info? Um, can you include a direct contact for access queries? Um, in terms of representation, are you looking at making your acquisitions more reflective of our neurodiverse population? Is it part of your strategic aims? If not, could it be? Demonstrating this principle will greatly differ depending on what kind of museum you are, your space and your collection, but a key part of it is working towards ensuring your neurodivergent access and visibility is more than standalone activities and one-off events, um, and that it does inform your wider museum practice. Thanks, Soraya. Um, so principle four is creating equitable opportunities and experience for neurodivergent people within the workforce and as volunteers. And Soraya touched on this a little bit earlier about um, ensuring that there's a recognition of the value of neurodivergent people um, as well. So we often see that it's a really difficult um, space for neurodivergent people to be and to disclose that they're neurodivergent within the sector. And that still is very much the case now. We hear that all the time about how it's either very difficult to disclose or um, people are discriminated against when they do disclose. So it's making sure that that changes <laughs> for a start and to ensure that those opportunities for neurodivergent people are equitable. Um, and that's at every stage. and. Later on, we have a case study um, from Becky, who I think will probably cover um, this area really, really well. Um, there's lots and lots of experience to support organisations to think about how they do this as well. Um, because from every stage of employment or of bringing people on as volunteers, there needs to be that consideration of what do neurodivergent people need. And if we have a sector that is very much kind of text and form heavy, interview heavy, um, and doesn't have those proper reasonable adjustments that can really support neurodivergent people, then they aren't going to be able to access the workforce um, or be volunteers. And as a result, we're all, um, that's that's really a really difficult situation for the individuals, but it's also really harming the sector because we need neurodivergent people. We need it to be a thriving um, sector. Neurodivergent um, people think in different ways. Our brains work differently. Um, there's so much benefit from having neurodivergent people and it makes organisations more resilient and it 
brings a brilliant business case to organisations to think about this. So there are lots of reasons why this needs to happen, apart from ethical reasons and reasons of non-discrimination. Um, but this is a clear part of our principles. And we feel that at the moment, often this is the area that is ignored um, and the focus tends to be on the audience, which is also absolutely important. But all of these things have to happen because if the workforce is not representative, then it's very difficult to change how the audience can be supported. And we know that as a museum sector generally. Um, so in terms of how that's supported, could you help share information and training amongst staff to ensure that that's across the whole level of the staffing system within the organisation? Could you start ensuring that the way you interview is different and the way you are seen by neurodivergent people is as a friendly neurodivergent space? Um, we sometimes see people saying, oh, well, we can't give questions in advance. It's not fair. It's like, is that right? Um, or just give all the questions to everybody in advance. You know, simple things like that. Sometimes we can get really, really stuck on that this is how we have to do it. And actually, we need to start questioning ourselves and saying, do we? Do we need to do that? Why are we doing that? What, you know, what damage is that causing by doing that? And then ensuring when we have staff within our organisation that we're making sure that in the long term, their wellbeing is supported. And that's really important because sometimes... As Soraya touched on earlier, you might not know that you have neurodivergent staff um, and volunteers, or they might not want to tell you. So it's how do you make sure that they are supported? Um, and they might not know. How, those anticipatory adjustments and ensuring that we put those in place is absolutely key. So that's what principle four looks at. And I'm just, yes, we're all right for time. Um, and then principle five is to advocate um, and Jill touched on this as well. How do you ensure that you can help make that change from your divergent people across the museum sector? Because your voices are absolutely crucial in helping that happen. We've spoken within the network about how difficult it is because often the people that are taking part in these um, activities are already recognizing that there's a need to change. Um, might already be new or divergent themselves or might recognise that part of their role is to ensure that they are accessible for neurodivergent people. How do you make the case to people who don't think that or who don't see that this is something that they should be doing? So it's properly trying to really think about how you can advocate within your own organisation, how you can kind of win over those hearts and minds of saying, you know, we need to be doing this. And sometimes it will be through those kind of ethical routes of saying, you know, this is something that we should be doing. If we're a public sector organisation, for example, we need to make sure that we're supporting neurodivergent people. But it could be having to help them understand that for a business and strategic case, we need to, you know, one fifth of the population are neurodivergent. If we're not neurodivergent friendly, then we are excluding those people, both as audiences and within our workforce. It's not a good resilient business model. We need to shift and change for that. So it's thinking about how can those arguments be made? It's something that we'll be doing as the Neurodiverse Museum to try and support and help that across the sector. But anything that you can be doing and the things you can be sharing and ideas of good practice and helping people understand that it isn't always a really expensive thing to be neurodivergent friendly. It's, it's a change in, in the way of thinking um, and the way in approaching um, provision and access and activity often. Um, so I think... We are at the end of our presentation. I think we are just about hitting time. Saray, I'm going to leave it to you to um, finish. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so the principles can be quite overwhelming and I can find it um, quite overwhelming to talk about them. But the one of the most important things to remember and to take away from this is that you don't have to have it all figured out to start working towards some of the key things they outline or to consider underpinning some of the thinking and uh, behind them in your work so but you will get to hear um, about some of the fantastic activity happening across the sector in um, our upcoming case studies um, and I feel that each one of them demonstrates um, each of the principles very well so keep an eye out for that. Um, the next Museums and Neurodiversity Network meeting is on June 18th, Tuesday, June 18th, and there's two times. So we'll have a meeting at 10.30 to 12, and then we'll also have another meeting in the evening, um, 6 to 7.30 for those who 
can't do it during working hours. Um, yeah, and if you have any questions, we have time for questions now, right, Justine? Uh, we could possibly take one or two. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe one. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, yeah, we, we're about to hit a break um, time, but if anyone has a question they want to drop in the chat or if there's any in there, Al, at the moment. Oh, crikey. Okay, what we'll do is we'll have a look in the break. Oh, Naomi, I can see you've put, raised your hand. I'm going to take your question. <laughs> If you want to come off mute um, and speak, you're welcome to. Yeah, it's going to be easier. Is that OK? <laughs> yes, please. Yeah, OK. <laughs> um, so I, I have a question. And um, I, I, like, first of all, it's, it's really exciting to me. All the things that you say, it's really interesting. And um, I'm very familiar with uh, neurodiversity. Uh, I'm new to explaining it to organisations. And um, and actually, my question is around this concept of voice. Uh, and I've, I, I asked this perhaps because I've overthought it myself. And I think it's quite easy to say we should have neurodiverse voices. It is very difficult, I think, in practice to define what this is because of intersectionality. Uh, so I just wondered um, if you could uh, elaborate perhaps on how you manage this. Well, now I'm not sure if I've understood the question, but I'm going to have a go. Okay. <laughs> do, you, do you want me to try, do you want to try and make it, uh, do you want me to try well, and say it simpler? Yeah, you could. I, I think what you're asking is how have we ensured that neurodivergent voice is included within the work that we're... No, sorry. No, okay, <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> So, 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 for example, in the past, I have worked with neurodivergent people whose voices actually differ from mine. Like we, we have differences of opinion, and that's okay uh, because there's diversity. And there's always a danger of representing some form of homogeneity where there is none. And I heard somebody earlier say, you know, it's quite easy for me to forget that we're not just talking about autism. And, and it's, it's precisely this, you know, we already have complexities within the, the, within the field of identity first or person first language. And, and this for me highlights a very specific problem of when we talk about voice, there's a danger of presenting it as if everyone within uh, who identifies as neurodivergent agrees in solidarity on this this way of viewing things where actually there is huge complexity and and very little homogeneity by definition so yeah, yeah I understand you now <laughs> thank, you. <laughs> thank you so much for clarifying that I have a very very slow process in Sweden taking questions at a time I yeah. shouldn't do it um but um yeah I, absolutely one of the key things and I'm hoping that this is going to answer the question one of the key things we talk about is that um, neurodivergent people are individuals as well and they don't all think the same and they don't all want things in the same way um, so it's trying to ensure that there's lots of discussion and lots of understanding of that um, across the sector whether people are neurodivergent or or neurotypical to ensure that that isn't happening um, because it absolutely has been you know every neurodivergent person or every autistic person wants backpack well, no, that's not the case. You need to be understanding that actually you're thinking about how do you ensure that you're equitable for neurodivergent audiences. Now, some of that might be anticipatory adjustments can make some assumptions, but there's still that need to understand that neurodivergent people, just like everybody else, are individuals, and there'll be various different intersectionalities that will impact on that. At the same time, um, the only way of understanding is to ask and consult and to constantly be doing exactly what you would be doing in terms of the rest of your audience engagement. Um, yeah, Soraya, did you want to say anything? Um, I don't feel I have, I can articulate okay. my thoughts at this time. But thanks. Al, <laughs> no worries, Soraya. <laughs> I just, for me, it comes down to that thing of nothing about us without us, I think. So have, having the neurodivergent voice is about having involved neurodivergent people at various stages of what 
museums are doing and in various parts of what museums are uh, are thinking about. Thanks, Al. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's massively important. The stereotypes that still exist, the issues that still exist around that, we see consistently within society, and largely we're seeing those embedded at education. You know, early on with both for neuro, neurodivergent individuals and neurotypical individuals, and that is taken back out in society and museums have a real role to shift and change that. Um, I'm conscious of time. Um, I'm gonna eat five minutes into the next session so that everyone can get a bit of a break. So if we could come back at 11.35, please stay on, stay within the Zoom space, just audio off and take visual off if you, if you need to. Um, but yeah, we'll be back at 11.35 for the next session um, and I'll see you all then. Hi again, everybody. I hope we're all back. Everybody's got everything that they need um and welcome back to the next part of the neurodiverse museum conference um so this session is a case study session um we're really delighted to have some brilliant speakers with us today to share their work that um a lot of the information about some of the things that they've been doing um and many will be joining us for the q a session this afternoon as well so so either drop questions in the chat that we'll keep for then um and also we've had some that have already come in um, so we're going to have a selection of five different uh, case studies. And we're going to have Becky Morris from Embed and Museums DCM, Amy Fletcher, who is a PhD researcher um, from Glasgow University, Carl Newbold and Jordan Keithley from Leeds Museums and Galleries, who will be doing a kind of double header, but also sort of slightly separate um, presentation about the different work that they've been doing. Um, and then we have Autism Berkshire and the Museum of English Rural um, live from Reading Museum. So lots of different um, examples and case studies um, that are in there. Without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Becky. Um, I'm going to see if I can spot you, Becky. There we are. Um, from Embed and Museums DCN. Thanks, Becky. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Hello, hello. Um, I'm just going to see if I can attempt to share my screen. Um, let's all, everybody keep your fingers crossed. See if it's working. Yes. Um, oh, that is wonderful. Right. And I'm just going to, because I need to have a look into this side, but we'll all be fine. So... Hello, I'm absolutely delighted to be here today and I'm so excited as well to be talking about one of my favourite things, which is neurodiversity. Um, I'm neurodivergent myself. I'm late diagnosed or late assessed dyspraxia and dyslexia, um, though I have to say that I am one of these people who believes that uh, I am indeed neurofabulous. And if you're within the gaming industry and other sectors, you'll be known as neuro spicy. So I'm all about the positivity about neurodiversity, but I'm also about what it can be like to work in places and spaces which we effectively manage because of various working cultures and also in terms of being able to have safe and supportive conversations about our profiles. So I'm just going to sort of give you a, a quick rundown of what I've been up to and then a little bit about DCN and then in bed. And then what we're going to do is have a look at things like the maturity model of what I've been up to. So I'm a trustee of Achievability, which is a neurodivergent led charity and one of the things that we do is do academic research and published reports in respect to key themes on neurodiversity. We've just literally hot off the press, just had our brand new um, 
e-journal on intersectionality and intergenerational stories in respect to neurodiversity, which you can get for free off the website, but donations are always uh, welcome. Also, um, I'm a member of the steering group member for the BSI PAS 6463. This is a very important document because it's the first guidance of its kind to support neurodiversity, neurodivergent people within the built environment. So that is, again, something that you can get for zero pence and you can download it from the BSI website. Um, I've also been very graciously asked to be an advisor for universities in respect to neurodiversity, but also I am was part of the Universal Music Creative Differences, um, which was to do about creating inclusive workplaces and practice from a multi-sector perspective. And one of the key elements was that, was key work from DCN, as you'll all remember. So, I founded DCN with a group of museum professionals way back in 2015. And the idea was, was that DCN was not going to be a network of disabled people and neurodivergent people, however you identify. Because primarily it didn't feel like a safe option at the time. And it didn't feel as though it was the best thing to do. What was the key element was to reach out to other sectors via the network to see what heritage was missing. What were those key potential solutions and practice that we could actually introduce to the sector to make it more intersectionally inclusive, but also to look at these solutions as a way to move forward collectively and collaboratively as a sector, as an organization and as the individual to open up that discussion between the employer and the employee. And we've got up to all sorts with the reopening recommendations during the pandemic, rebuilding heritage, which are both online, digital inclusion. We've supported a change in the law for changing places toilets and we increase funding for accessibility through the MEND fund, uh, which was really exciting. That was a good day at the office, that was. And this has led to Embed. Um, Embed is now what I do. Um, it's a multi-sector, um, one-stop shop where we can support people um, in respect to advice, access auditing, you may have seen me run around a museum with my trusty tape measure. I'm the lead access auditor. We also do coaching and mentoring. We develop staff networks or do health checks. We do inclusive comms, reviews and websites. But we also are a constructive, critical friend. So when it comes to key work that we do, we're always about, you know, come and have a chat. It's OK. Let's have a chat. And also being able to help move people on, no matter how small the organization is, no matter how big the organization is, this is about supporting the authentic voice of people. And often when we shine a mirror up or spotlight on a key element of practice that's not working, often it's about how we can actually create practical support to move that conversation forward. But most importantly, it's about how we can actually, you know, where's your good stuff and identifying your good practice. So we're not finger wavers. We're more about how do we engage with respect to a constructive, critical friend. And the key thing is with the bottom line in all of this is the ability to ask a question. So. We know that change is all around us with societal needs and requirements, but we also need to think about how we can adjust, particularly with adjustments in the workplace and accountability to make sure that organisations meet the legislation that they need to, duty of care, 
but also to call out the toxicity, but reduce risk of it happening in the first place. So it's about understanding where that is coming from and how we can create workplaces where all of us feel like we can be, we feel valued and can belong. It's also about how with neurodivergent people, they we can be our authentic selves. So if we have an idea, if we've got that key connection in respect to saving money or creating sustainability, we can say that and be ourselves without fear or concern about what do I sound like? What do I look like? To be ourselves, but also to understand about how we are cross profile in all of this. We are literally across the whole spectrum. I'm dyspraxic, dyslexic. I have a little bit of ADHD, I believe, thrown in there. But also Achievability did research in respect to how cross profile is absolutely vital when it comes to workplace and visitor support. But also in terms of support, who has agency to say this is good practice? So it's about how we can collectively support each other, collaboratively look at organisations, but also sectorally how we can have responsibility to create a sustainable, intersectionally inclusive sector. And I'm going to very quickly whiz on to this. When it comes to EDI, we are always considering about the maturity model of where organisations sit in respect to whether they're blissfully unaware of what they need to do to strictly thinking about compliance, often condi condition-led processes. But this is more now, more vitally now, thinking about strategic thinking in terms of creating that sustainability, but also having that pot of money and how it can actually be more about legacy and embedding key practice so you can support intersectionality rather than, right, we'll do this with this. It's also about how we can weave it into the fabric so then the policies and the processes can support people in respect to recruitment, but also improve on representation and also understand those key processes that may cause difficulties with that representation. And then that whole situation about disruptors, which is not, it sounds a bit kind of like, this is the situation and we're going to disrupt it. This is more about actually being courageous and saying, we're not going to wait for change to happen. We're going to do it ourselves and we're going to look at our situation authentically and also as leaders to move forward, to engage with audiences, but also tackle those key problems with, with literally those key processes in mind. And then leading it down to people uh, people centric approaches so the power the power of having positive challenging conversations about conversation and collaboration to understand that diversity within neurodiversity that key practice like the paths like the universal music stuff like achievability and some of the great work that's happening in the sector about how we can stem conversations and collaboration. So when we look at a pot of money, we can actually say, we need to think about this differently, but we've already done this strategically. So rebuilding heritage being a key example. It's about lived experience, but also making sure that the individual only has to share what they need to. It's not about how we can effectively say what's happened in respect to individuality this is about psychologically safe spaces as an organization and also as a sector to say if change is going to happen how does that process support the individual to open up and feel able to have that conversation and most importantly of all it's about deeds because we, we, you know, you know how it is. I've been in the sector 25 years. You, often it's about what can we do to move from a conversation to endearing and important action. But 
most importantly of all, just about to lose my voice, uh, most importantly of all, it's the intersectionality, that we're not one identity in all of this, that we are parts of an incredible, diverse world, but also most importantly, it's about how we can talk to each other, collaborate, and also support each other, because we all really work hard in this sector, and sometimes it's about uplifting others and other people to say, great job, but what can we do to build on that? So we can help with all kinds of things. We can do your reviews. We can help work with you and also do digital and access audits. And also we can support you with your strategy and planning. So if you've got that idea or if you say, I want to do something to support neurodivergent people, you know, we're here to help in respect to the workforce and also for the audiences. There we are, sorted. Jobs are good. Thanks so much, Becky. Oh, so much amazing good stuff in there. Um, yeah, and I can see that in the chat, there's discussion about um, what you've been talking about as well, which is brilliant. And Becky will be with us for the Q&A um, this afternoon. Um, and I love the fact of uplifting uplifting what other people are doing within the sector and that is absolutely central to what the neurodiverse museum is trying to do what's happening where is it happening how can we learn about it is it in the sector is it outside of the sector can we bring it in and learn about it share it learn from it um and everything is around that progression rather than oh isn't it awful <laughs> why aren't they doing this it's like well we know things aren't happening and aren't perfect but how can we change it how can we support and make that shift and it's brilliant having all of you here today because that is how it will work and sharing all of this information so generously is brilliant thank you becky um i'm now going to move on to our next speaker which is amy amy fletcher um from glasgow university i'm going to let you introduce yourself amy um uh, over to you <laughs> I think you might be on mute, Amy, if you're speaking. <laughs> just there we just go. Um, so hi everyone. My name is Amy Fletcher, and as Justy mentioned, I'm a PhD researcher at the University of Glasgow, and I am also neurofabulous, as Becky has introduced me to that wonderful term. So I'm going to use it. Um, and today I am excited to share a bit about my PhD research with you all. So about um, my research into making museums accessible for neurodivergent people, primarily focusing on visitors, but as the research has developed, it has become incredibly clear that there is a lot in there about making the workplace accessible too. So to, today I'll give a quick overview of what the research is and what it's involved so far. Um, I will give an overview of the museum workers survey findings. Because we only have 15 minutes, I can't go into all the details of what neurodivergent people said in the visitor survey, but some of that will come through as we talk about it. Um, I will then talk about what these findings mean for the sector and what the next steps can be to make the workplace more accessible. So the research overview. At the beginning of this PhD, I wanted to make sure that the research I was doing reflected the priorities of neurodivergent people. So together with two focus groups, I developed the research questions for this study. And they're primarily focused on visitor experience and was focused on centering the neurodivergent adult voice because typically that has been missing when thinking about how to make museums accessible for autistic people, for neurodivergent people. So it's focused on what the motivations are for visiting and what the barriers are to get a better understanding of how these things can impact whether people attend museums. The second was to think about what museums currently offer and again reflect on what the barriers are that impact museums in delivering 
neurodivergent specific resources and events. And finally, the focus is on how museums and the cultural heritage sector can learn from neurodivergent adults and work together to adapt practices to make it more engaging, accessible and equitable. So over the last couple of years, this has taken shape in what this timeline shows. So there's been multiple levels of consultation through focus groups, through individual feedback from neurodivergent people. It then resulted in two surveys being launched, one for neurodivergent adults, which had 466 responses in total um, that were fully completed, and the museum worker survey, which had 130 responses. These were then closed and analyzed, and I worked with these findings to put together workshops, to get feedback from museum workers, from neurodivergent adults, and to further refine the themes, to identify what the priorities are, to then develop a guidance toolkit for the sector. So what were the key museum worker findings? Firstly, I think one of the biggest points that I took away from the findings was just how many people were identifying as neurodivergent in the survey. So as part of the survey, I asked people whether they identified as neurodivergent. And in total, 37% responded yes, and a further 8 to 9% responded maybe. So again, significantly higher representation than perhaps would have been expected based on the level of disclosure in the sector. There was also a really broad range of roles and organisations represented from front of house to collections, volunteers to directors. So it showed a really, a really good broad range of perspectives being brought into the discussion. There was also a really good understanding of accessibility in terms of making space that is equitable, accessible, that people feel that their needs can be met. But at the same time, there were low levels of confidence in what was available and whether museums were actually delivering and creating those accessible spaces that they were aware should be there. But again, there was also a very clear motivation to see an improvement in understanding of accessibility to make museums accessible for neurodivergent people. And finally, the high numbers of neurodivergent people that um, identified as neurodivergent or were identified by other museum workers as being present in the sector showed that the findings and the future direction of this research needs to move beyond just the visitor experience and towards how to make museums more accessible for the workforce. And this, this came up as well when thinking about what should go in the toolkit. So again, a lot of the focus of what the respondents to the survey wanted was more information about what the barriers are so that they can be addressed, of what advice could help to develop resource or event development to make sure that needs across a range of neurodivergent um, communities are met. There was also a focus on having advice on how to directly involve autistic and neurodivergent adults in, in developing practice, in actively putting together programming and resources that are available for neurodivergent people and anyone who may need them. And one of the things that came up through the anecdotal um, questions was around a desire for more information about the workforce. 
So whilst these questions focused on the visitor experience, time and time again, respondents said that they wanted to better understand how to support their neurodivergent colleagues, how to support volunteers who work in the sector, and how to alleviate the amount of expectation that there is on neurodivergent people leading on neurodivergent resource development. So what do these findings mean for the sector? So firstly, the high presence of neurodivergent people in this survey demonstrate that there is a high number of neurodivergent people in the sector. And therefore, it's incredibly important that the work that we put into making museums accessible for visitors is also put into making sure the sector is accessible for museum workers. It found that a lot of neurodivergent adults and often young people are voluntarily leading the work to make museums more accessible. They are undertaking work in addition to their own workloads. They are taking part in often short-term projects. So it highlighted that there is a need to reflect on this model to make sure that the responsibility for making museums accessible is shared across the organization and not just certain certain sections like um, engagement or front of house, it should be embedded throughout. It was found that there were gaps in understanding about neurodiversity, but that there was also that desire to fill it. So having sectoral training, having neurodivergent people lead the way in um, supporting the development of understanding across the sector. It was felt that the needs of neurodivergent people as visitors and as, as museum workers was not a priority for management, but also that they felt that findings from this type of research and the work of the Neurodiverse Museum can help to boost awareness and understanding of the importance of focusing on neurodivergent workers needs as well as visitors. And finally, that there is a desire for greater support and guidance to develop um, experience from that HR recruitment process all the way through to day-to-day -day experience in the sector. So this means that the museum sector needs to look beyond simply the experience of its visitors. It needs to work with its its current workers with potential workers to identify what is needed to make it accessible. There is a need to invest in training and resources that benefit the entire workforce by boosting their confidence and understanding of neurodiversity and that creating guidance on inclusive recruitment processes of good examples of networking support spaces would be beneficial to creating an equitable experience for all workers. So to conclude, museums are showing a great understanding and motivation when it comes to making museums accessible for neurodivergent visitors. But it's also really crucial that we take the enthusiasm and ensure that we are improving the experience of the workforce as well. That by working directly with neurodivergent people to identify what those barriers are, what would be beneficial support, and what would make it a safer environment to disclose and know your needs are met, would be beneficial in creating a neuroaffirming sector for us all. And in terms of the next steps for this research, I will be developing sectoral guidance that will be informed by the research findings, by lived experience, good examples of professional practice and research in order to help support the sector on this journey to a neuroaffirming, accepting and understanding place. Thank you.
Thanks so much, Amy. Oh, again, so much information in there and some really practical support that's coming out of your research. Um, some brilliant headline figures that can support some of the advocacy, I think, back across the sector. Um, and it's going to be brilliant to see what else you uh, develop that can support the sector going forward. Um, I'm fascinated to hear more about your work um, and to see how that can support the sector. And I think it's key for us as the neurodiversity museum to make sure that we can keep pulling all of those strands together and help sharing that out what i'm really keen to ensure doesn't happen with this work is things like i don't know if a lot of people in here will have used things like inspiring learning for all that was created oh so many years ago but seems to have gone out of favor for various different reasons often the museum sector will put things together that go oh this is a really good way of working but actually it's not embedded so some of the work that's been developed by people like Becky and people like you, Amy, and, and other people, we really need to make sure that this is absolutely central going forward. And it's not just a um, something that people think they can do and then forget about. Um, I'm going to stop talking. Um, I'm really, really impressed that our speakers are hitting time and there's so much pressure on the next one. It's <laughs> now that I've said that. Um, but I'm going to move on. I'm going to um, also ask our speakers to keep looking in the chat because we will have time for Q&A later, but I'm conscious there won't be loads of time and there are a lot of questions. So if you're able to answer questions in the chat as they come in as well, that would be really helpful. Otherwise, we will make sure we send questions out to speakers if they don't get our answers and we don't have time so that we can respond outside of the session. But do just keep dropping into the chat and we'll just keep um, asking people to answer them as much as we can. Um, I'm going to move on now to Carl. Um, I can see that you've um, <laughs> come into vision. So I've gone for you first instead of Jordan. <laughs> yes. So Carl, um, from Leeds Museums and Galleries, um, I'm going to let you again introduce yourself um, and share your screen. Thanks, Carl. Lovely. Thank you. OK, well, um, hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Carl. Uh, I, my pronouns are he, him. Um, I am a white male with short, dark hair and a beard um, and a slightly weary look in my eyes. Uh, <laughs> um, so thank you very much for inviting me along to this event. Um, uh, and yeah, um, it's it's great to be part of this to chat about um, the sort of things that we've been doing here at Leeds Museums and Galleries, uh, along with Jordan as well. Um, so for my half of it, I'll be talking about Careers for All, uh, which is a project I run through Leeds Museums and Galleries um, that uh, produces career aspiring activities uh, for young people uh, with special educational needs and or disabilities. Um, so a brief introduction to Leeds Museums and Galleries. Uh, we're the largest local authority museum service in the UK outside of London. We have uh, nine sites uh, across uh, uh, all those nine sites, we have 1.3 million objects um, and around 200 staff that work for us as well. Uh, and those are the sites that we work at. Um, so to introduce you to Careers for All, if you've not come across it before, um, we create these career aspiring activities. Uh, and the idea is that uh, we were wanting to create like a little bridge um, between learning within school and college uh, to earning in the workplace. Um, and uh, oops, <laughs> sorry. Uh, and uh, to increase skills uh, and confidence around uh, the workplace as well. Um, so my original uh, setup when I started, my role was only two and a half days a week and it was supposed to be temporary it was supposed to only last for two years and then it would disappear um and that started in 2019 so i'm still here <laughs> and i work more days and actually now um the role has been swallowed more broadly into the council um and it's uh, counted partly as an employment and skills role now um and that's due to the importance that the employment and skills team have seen within it. So hopefully when I talk about the things that we have done at these museums, you'll have some things that you might be able to take away um, as uh, inspiration of perhaps what you could do within your own experiences as well. Um, so 
here I put scaffolding participants into employable adults. Uh, until this morning, I read through it again, and I put the question mark at the end, and I'll tell you why in a bit. Um, so the idea is that the programs that I run, uh, we offer a range of different things um, that is uh, supposed to create like a journey or a ladder for participants to climb up, um, growing in confidence uh, to uh, a point where uh, they feel that um, they've got a stronger CV or potentially um, wanting to look for employment or potentially uh, as some of the participants have had just the the confidence to not be in a learning environment in, anymore in school um, or to go and engage in activities outside of their house. Um, and this really starts with um, outreach workshops. Um, so this sort of scaffold approach was really put together through consultation with um, teachers and tutors from what we call SILKS, Specialist Inclusive Learning Centres. Um, a lot of uh, other locations around the UK will call it specialist provision or uh, special schools. Um, but the consultation, I went into a bunch of schools, I said what we were planning to do for Careers for All, and they basically sat me down and said, look, this is what we want. Um, so everything I'm telling you is is a, has come into fruition through these consultations. Um, so that includes outreach workshops um, where I go into schools, charities, colleges, um, and essentially take collection to them. Um, and these are really, really useful for students who are not feeling confident to, to leave um, the school environment uh, initially. Um, it's also really handy in that I can meet a lot of students in one sitting as well. So I can meet a class worth in a silk that often is still below 10, um, but it means that I, I can form that rapport there. We also do taster days. These are one day work experience. Uh, and anybody who comes to these and has a really good time can end up coming into a full work experience as well. Um, I'll cover a little bit more on that on the next slide. Uh, we have also run a youth panel in the past, um, uh, specifically through Careers for All. Um, but actually, more broadly, we have several youth panels that we run across Leeds Museums and Galleries. And one of the special things about um, having several youth panels is that uh, it means that the Careers for All participants um, can then go on um, to our other youth panels within the organization as well. Um, we've got that safe space that it's a careers for all panel initially, um, but then there are bigger panels elsewhere that they could engage with. We also have uh, what are called project placements. Uh, these are uh, paid employment opportunities at entry level, and we're very careful with how these are advertised, presented. Um, and how we run interview processes in order to make these ex as accessible as possible. And in actual fact, this is leading to a wider change within the organization uh, more generally as well. Um, and at the end, my final bullet point, why did I put the question mark? Uh, and this is because I've seen actually some of the activities within Careers for All aren't about becoming employable adults. Um, it is uh, potentially just a a stepping stone into greater confidence or um, seeing opportunities outside uh, of school that previously wouldn't have been thought about. Um, I have had a young person who finished their work experience um, once who said that they wanted to go to London and look at museums and they, they hadn't really visited museums in their past before their placement. So that for them was a huge step and a huge positive. Um, so these are, uh, uh, in terms of our work experience, um, I think what's really important with how it works and how to help make it successful is to not make it off the peg. Um, there are certain ac activities or if you like um, job roles um, that I'm able to offer more often, um, but uh, it's very much not a, a pre-assembled box that we try and fit somebody into. Um, so I will meet with the student, find out about their interests, um, find out what strengths they have, what they want to do for their career in the future, um, and then 
try and chat to the staff um, that are in our team that that would be most suitable really uh, and um, find the right collections that they could work with. Um, so a typical day, um, if, if one can call it that, um, could be uh, generally to start off with a couple of hours a day. And this is purposefully to reduce the amount of pressure um, as much as we can um, on, on things like uh, having an extended amount of time with, with people or places that you're unfamiliar with or um, having that sort of sudden jump into the deep end from, from being in school to, to working with us. Um, our work experiences typically are uh, 16 to 25 year olds um, uh, because that is kind of our target audience in terms of colleges um, and uh, six forms within specialist inclusive learning centers. Um, and then we have what worked and what didn't. Um, so uh, very much uh, it depends on the individual. Uh, and I think this has been a running theme uh, throughout. Um, somebody asked a question at the, at the very start before the first break about, you know, um, just because somebody is neurodivergent doesn't mean that they hold the opinion that every neurodivergent individual holds. Uh, and I think that's really, really important to understand. Um, so uh, typically um, having a prepared timetable or knowledge of what is coming each week uh, really, really helps. Um, but there are some that I have uh, worked with who like kind of the ad hoc uh, nature of, of work at times. Um, and then finally, recording it is really important to us as well. So um, people who engage in our work experience do uh, like a uh learning like a learning journal almost um which is reflecting upon their days it uh um and their day's work and what they've done and what they've learned and it, it's essentially um cv fodder um for them and an understanding of the experience that they are gaining and a, a chance to reflect uh, but it also works really well as assessment for us at leeds museums um that narwhal story just there uh, you can click on the link and read it. It's actually something that one of our work experience students put together um, where uh, they got really interested in the narwhal uh, tusk that we have in our collection and so wrote a learning resource on it. So I just wanted to show it as a bit of an example. Um, I love showing off the work that some of our placements have done. So there's uh, the voice here of some of the young people that we've worked with. Um, more recently, um, I'll, I'll let you have a read through that when the, the, the slides are shared, because I'm aware of time, I'll keep moving on. Um, but ultimately, I wanted to cover that this, this frontline programs and partner um, led to a partnership with Illuminate Education Group. Uh, this is a collection of colleges within Yorkshire. Um, and it was done to create more accessible uh, employment methods. Um, within our organization, but also to look at how the college could assist their students in terms of applications um, and interviews as well. So we put together, um, it's called the ETF project, and we put together uh, several focus groups involving young people from Leeds College, um, our youth panel at one of our museums, and a professionals group of teachers, tutors, and uh, members from an employment and skills group. And we ended up with huge amounts of feedback. Um, this is just one slide out of several. Uh, again, I can share these um, so you can read them in more depth later. And this is one that was done by our panel at the Industrial Museum. And it created this, a huge amount of change. We've talked about uh, recruitment and staffing uh, and the importance of that previously. Uh, and that's a huge part of my role now within the organization, thanks to this to this project. Um, so here are some of the bullet points that we've changed, pre-application um, Zooms where people can join and meet staff, hear about uh, the job role they're going for um, before they apply for it. Uh, applicants are given contact of somebody who can answer queries on access. We openly allow notes and support workers as well. Um, 
questions and visual stories that was mentioned before questions being sent in advance um, and as somebody mentioned as well this is for everybody um, so it's leveling the playing field field it's not just questions are sent in advance if you disclose um, that you are neurodivergent um, or or have a learning disability it's it's blanket for everybody you don't have to say that you are to get these um, and also training for staff as well. Um, and it's led to great impact more widely within the council. So um, one of the things that I'm most proud of is uh, that the museum has had an impact in the council as a whole and recruitment practices are changing um, as our diversity within our staff and volunteer teams. But I will stop there. If anybody wanted to know more from me, um, then please do get in contact or um, tap the questions into the chat and I'll try and cover them. Um, but otherwise I'm going to pass over to Jordan at this point. Thanks so much, Carl. Jordan, I think you're there. There we go. Um, I am. Hello. Oh, okay, <laughs> you go for it. <laughs> nice one, thank you. So let's begin sharing. Come on, PowerPoint. Success, cool. So, hi. Um, I am Jordan Keatsley. My pronouns are he, him. I'm a white British person who apparently looks quite young. Um, I've got dark brown short hair and now have quite large dark green glasses. Um, so who am I? Um, I also work within Leeds Museums and Galleries, but I'm the Youth Engagement Curator at Leeds City Museum. That means I fall within the kind of wider community team at Leeds Museums and Galleries and Really, it's the job of that team to represent and to advocate for and to form relationships with the local communities of Leeds, which means we work with a great kind of diverse range of different audiences and kind of our job revolves around relationship building, really. Um, but with me being the youth engagement curator, I sort of have that added focus of um, working with 14 to 24 year olds. Now, the case study that I want to share with you today is um, an exhibition called Overlooked, which was curated by a group called the Preservative Party. So again, these are a group of 14 to 24 year olds um, who are based at Leeds City Museum. The group was founded in 2010 and it was a six week experiment initially, but here we are 14 years later, um, nearly um, still kind of curating and kind of working and pushing for change, really. And that's something to stress is that this group really is a, a group of kind of young advocates and very activist in its nature to kind of push for greater representation and, and inclusivity. Um, the group meet weekly for two hours every Thursday. Um, and really what is really important here is they have kind of ultimate agency in what they do and the topics that they focus upon, which means the museum service has to place an enormous amount of trust within them um, and to kind of give them the space to kind of talk about what they want to. Um, one thing that's important to me is that there's sort of progression within the group and sort of into um, the museum service. And it's something that we're trying to improve. I myself was a member when I was there in 2010, but it, I can't say to you, it was a smooth linear process from me being a member to me having this position now. Um, but it's something that we're trying to improve is that kind of seamless transition into museum-based roles. So the Overlooked exhibition. Um, in whole, this was an effort for the group to, they felt that when they visited museums, they didn't feel represented. Um, that them as individuals, their identity, what kind of their protected characteristics, characteristics, whatever, they felt their stories were not there. And therefore they felt overlooked and they wanted to tell the voices, tell these stories, um, of the local communities in a very kind of challenging way, which meant the Overlooked exhibition really focused on, it was very ambitious, it was very broad in the subjects it looked upon. We told the story of Angela Morley, who was the first openly trans woman to be nominated from, for an Academy Award. But then round the corner, there was a story of an, uh, of an ancient enslaved person, 3000 years old. And then round the corner from that, several films made by the deaf community, around the corner from that, looking at um, women during the First World War, and then looking at 
neurodivergent um, voices as well. So again, the only thing that was linking these people is that they had been overlooked, which meant it was a very ambitious project, but it was very kind of authentic in how the group approached it. Um, here's just proof that they did do it. Um, they were they wrote the text, they chose the objects, they made the cups of tea and coffee for the communities that we went out to form relationships with. They designed the panels, chose the images, you know, absolutely everything painted the gallery. Um, so what I want to show you now is a, a small clip from a section, if I can get to it, because the banner's in the way. Um, we made a film, which ultimately is to kind of document the process and the stories that I'm telling you now and want to focus upon are the members of the group who are neurodivergent and they wanted to share their, their personal experiences and what it was like for it is like for them being neurodivergent individuals and the kind of experiences that they've uh, come across and just sort of spreading awareness really about that. So I have a short film which let's hope it works. In the UK, the group. We want to see themselves represented in museum collections and where this project has stemmed from. We designed the whole thing with accessibility in mind, knowing that it was going to be open for everyone. I am a later diagnosed autistic person um, and I'm also very openly queer and I have been through a lot of educational processes and work processes as a person who has been later diagnosed with autism. I think it's really relevant to talk about autistic history. Um, a lot of people don't know a lot about people who are autistic, or they only know about people who are considered to be autistic superheroes and uh, people like Nikola, uh, Nikola Tesla and Einstein and people who we would look back and think are autistic. I think it's important for autistic people's voices to be found within museums and galleries because there's a lot of great information and perspectives that autistic people can bring to the heritage sector and to look at the video that was made about stimming which was really awesome. I was a person who for a really long time tried to control my stimming and didn't stim in a way that was particularly open and to see people being introduced to the first time for what it was like to stim and what stimming looks like was amazing. I think it's a lot easier for a lot of people, I know that it is for me, to have something on a badge that maybe if you need to you could reference rather than saying I am autistic and I don't want to make eye contact or I have ADHD, I might interrupt you. I'm Alice Wood and I run Doodle People, uh, which is a business which makes kind of communicative and representative apparel to give people information at a glance that you might not want to espouse immediately in conversation. And it's kind of like social and public transport aids in a way. It was really cool. My husband took some pictures of me, like just grinning ear to ear next to the badges. I'm Soraya. I'm a neurodivergent creative and advocate. I worked on a zine as part of Overlook on neurodiverse terminology and language. I want to share like a quote by Judy Singer, who kind of coined the term neurodiverse. She said it describes the limitless variability of human cognition and the uniqueness of each human mind. I think a lot of people use the terminology and they're well-meaning, but they're not exactly correct. And I think to begin shifting perspectives, we need to speak about people in the way that's supportive to them. I was very emotional the first time I saw Overlooked. Admittedly, I've had some personal work with the group, the press party. I was an ex-member of the press party and have come through the service myself and have done a lot of work with the group. And upon seeing it for the first time, it was very overwhelming in a really good way. When we were installing the uh, exhibition in January, honestly, I just found it fun. It was cool to come to Leeds and help paint the walls and stuff and watch the space like slowly transform into all this. Um, so thank you for just watching that. Um, that entire uh, film was made really just sort of as a report to capture the voices and the various different communities that we worked with, but it was really important to kind of spotlight what the Preservative Party did, and especially those that worked on the section, looking at the neurodiverse community really did and sharing their sort of authentic experiences. And, and that was what was really important is it was a section 
led by and written by neurodivergent people focusing upon the things that were important to them. And that was talking about things such as diagnosis, about stimming, about traits and presentations, um, and just sort of raising awareness, really, and introducing visitors to the language of it. Um, we've sort of had some really powerful feedback from visitors and especially um, some of the sort of special educational needs schools that they found this sort of very empowering, um, especially the film that we made looking at stimming, um, which really is just a member of the group showing us their stims alongside an explanation of why people do it and what it can look like or sound like. Um, and again, just sort of debunking some of the myths and trying to create a sort of protected environment where people may feel safe to do that um, a bit more openly. Um, again, looking at doodle people, these sort of badges that are sort of communicative and they sort of set a boundary and many of the facility party really felt very empowered to have these badges and Alice from Doodle People became like a very close kind of partner on the project and we all wore their badges all the time and many staff members and many members of the group sort of just wear these badges daily now. Um, so again, it's been really sort of powerful to share that. Um, we also built into the space, and this is immediately adjacent to the section looking at the new divergent voices, um, a kind of reflection zone. Now, overlooked in general was very triggering. You know, it was a it was a, an exhibition that really spoke a lot about personal trauma, but also kind of violence and discrimination, slavery. There were depictions of conversations surrounding human remains, and it was really important to the group that the whole exhibition is accessible to those that we are hoping to you know, advocate for. And therefore we needed to give the visitor permission to step out, you know, to step away, to have a quiet space, to use some kind of ear defenders or just, just have permission to, to relax rather than feeling like they had to leave. Because if you're relying on visitors who are overwhelmed leaving, well, there's no actual guarantee that they're leaving into a better environment than this one, you know, we could, they could run into a school group and, and where a city centre site, you know, they may feel trapped. So we wanted to provide this kind of quiet, reflective area um, as part of that. And that brings me on to sort of access of the whole exhibition in general. And this is again, sort of the members of the group who wrote the section looking at neurodiversity really led on this. It was, you know, what do they want? What would be useful to them to come to an exhibition? And it was a map, a floor plan, which says where the themes are, but it also says where the triggers are, not only um, you know, the kind of emotional triggers, you know, it has to be physically accessible, but emotionally accessible, uh, as well as intellectually accessible. Um, so again, this map has had such a positive response, but you know, as I'll come on to later, we didn't reinvent the wheel here. This wasn't hard to produce. It wasn't expensive to produce. It was just something that was the result of lots of conversations with people about, you know, well, what would stop you from coming? Would you want to go to an area that is talking about violence and discrimination? Would it be better if you knew where that is and you could avoid it? Yes. Um, and again, this was sort of next to some um, additional sort of aids that we put in there, looking uh, magnifying glasses, ear defenders, um, dyslexic friendly, large print. Um, and now I'm we're working quite closely with um, the partners that we connected with for Overlooked, but how can we sort of roll this out en masse now uh, around the whole museum? But it's not just looking at sensory defense. It's, you know, to, it's looking at, you know, things that actually elevate the experience for um, neurodivergent visitors. Again, this bench apparently was like the most accessible bench in the world. And now we have it apparently. And um, visitors are really um, sort of pleased that it exists. It's wheelchair accessible, it's wood, so it's warm, it's a certain height. So if you're an older person or have mobility issues, you can get on and off it. There's like a tapping rail for if you're partially sighted or blind and use a cane. Um, now what I just want to kind of close on uh, the learnings from this. Um, and this is, I'm just gonna read these straight out. So we must understand and seek to represent and support the diversity of neurodiversity. I think with the conversations that the Preservancy Party have had with the wider sort of Leeds City Council and other partners is, there is obviously a great focus on autism and ADHD, but the goal of the Preservative Party is to, to spread the awareness of, of, of the whole umbrella term and, and how you can support and represent everyone that falls within that. Um, we learned that co-curated projects 
necessitate a flexible timeline. And this really also ties into the fact that rigid processes must be adapted. Um, so to give you an example, we work in a museum, there is a text deadline and there's a design deadline. However, if a member of our group is sharing their personal experiences about what life was like for them during the process of their diagnosis of autism, and it's taking them a bit longer to kind of write that or to think about that, or actually they don't communicate in a written way, and it's actually just weeks of me talking to them and trying to write down what they think and make sure that, that it is representative, that deadline kind of needs to be adjustable. You know, I'm not saying throw it in the bin, but I'm saying like there needs to be a wider understanding in the sector and the teams that we work with that for this to be authentically co-curated and for us to actually represent the voices of the neurodivergent people that they're working with, we cannot hold them to strict inflexible deadlines. You know, yes, I could have written it, but what's the point in that? You know, um, and that's why Overlook sort of really did actually break some boundaries and really did feel like a step forward for museums because it was just uncompromisingly authentic and it made, unfortunately, working with me a bit difficult. Um, but the the wider service were really supportive of this. Um, and that is, you know, bringing those teams along with us and the mission that we were trying to create um, really kind of eased that process. Um, and then finally, accessible practice does not have to break the budget. Um, you know, it was simply one extra panel to design the access map. Ear defenders were relatively cheap. Uh, open dyslexia font, just reprinting all of the text into a booklet. These adjustments were really affordable, made a massive difference. Um, and yes, we are wanting to kind of build on this and do more sensory mapping across the entire site. But we were just working within one exhibition and we provided very accessible resources and support within that. And it wasn't much more expensive. And also tying into what Carl kind of closed on, you know, adjusting practice to think about, you know, I'm doing some interviews. I'm going to send out a visual journey of, of the plan of that. And let's send out the questions, extra little steps that may add an hour or two on to the prep for me, but makes an, an enormous difference for all of the people who are coming to that, whether they are neurodivergent or not. Um, we've had a positive response to all of that. And that's my information blurb finished. Um, if you have any questions, please um, do get in touch later. I will be at the panel later for half an hour. So thank you for listening. Oh, thank you so much as well, Jordan. Carl, Jordan, amazing. Um, there's comments in the chat. Definitely go and have a, have a look. Um, it's just such a brilliant example, case study of how you, know, you can properly just embed this work but I know it's not been easy <laughs> um, and it's brilliant to listen to both of you because it is inspiring to hear how you've done that um, and talking of inspiring I can't remember which one of you mentioned it but the inspiration porn that we often see about um, neurodivergent people museums shifting that and changing that perspective I think it was somebody that was speaking in your film Carl um, yeah we have to change that um, and start thinking about how we support neurodivergent voice much more differently and representation. Thank you both. Um, I'm going to move on. Um, and well done for sticking to time. <laughs> I'm going to move on now to um, our final case study. Um, slight change of person. I'm going to try and get this right. So we've got Philippa, Jane and Lucy. Um, and they are from Hudson Berkshire Museum of English Rural Life and Reading Museum. Um, to get Again, to give a case study um, about their work. Now, Philippa, are you starting? Am I handing over to you first? Yeah, I can I can share the screen if that's okay. That's Thanks, fantastic. Justine. Um, what time do you want us to finish? So you have 15 minutes. 15 minutes, brilliant. Okay. Thank and you then so we'll much. adapt the um the next, we'll probably still give everybody a 45 minute break and we'll just take a little bit of time from the afternoon. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you ever so much. And thank you so much for having us. Um, it's been absolutely brilliant and so many inspiring projects and speakers. Um just Fantastic. Um, we have come as a trio today. So um, what we thought we would do is just briefly introduce ourselves, if that is okay. So Jane, would you like to go first? So I'm Jane Stamford-Beale. I'm a um, middle-aged woman. Um, I've got um, children with highlighted hair and blue eyes. Um, I also have three neurodiverse children. I am myself dyslexic and dyspraxic. And um, one of the clinical directors, of the local mental health trust, who also is responsible for autism, she told me that I should um, self-diagnose as an adult. So make that uh, what you want. 
Fantastic. Thank you, Jane. And Lucy? I'm Lucy Griffin. I'm Visitor Services Officer at Reading Museum. And yes, I suppose to describe myself, I'm, I'm a tall, white, middle-aged lady. <laughs> but yeah, delighted to be here. Thank you. Um, and I'm Philippa Heath. I'm the Learning and Engagement Manager at the Museum of English Rural Life. Um, I'm a not so tall, five foot four, um, white um, lady with dark hair. Um, and we are thrilled today to be sharing with you um, a case study of Museums at My Way, which is a neurodivergent program um, which takes place at Reading Museum and the Merle. Um, and just introducing both of our museums, if I kick off Lucy about the Merle, um, we were founded in 1951. We're part of the University of Reading um, and we are a museum which celebrates the life and work of people's experiences in the countryside. Over to you, Lucy. Wonderful. So we're in the large Victorian town hall in the centre of town, if you've been to Reading. Um, nine galleries, but highlights are some of our finds from Roman Silchester, medieval Reading Abbey. And we've obviously got our um, unique drawing copy of the Bayer Tapestry. And we also have um, changing exhibitions. So as well as being connected by both being in the town of Reading, um, we are also connected through Museums Partnership Reading, which is known um, internally as MPR. And it's a consortium of both of our museums working together, which has been supported by the Arts Council England's um, National Portfolio Organisation funding. Um, and since two, 2018 um, we've been an MPO and we have been developing at both of our museum sites a wide, wide range of projects and programs um, and also kind of responding to the challenges created by the pandemic in engaging and reaching diverse audiences in our local area. Um, Museums My Way has been one of those programmes that has been funded as part of this Arts Council funding. And the next slide is going to be Jane talking a little bit about um, how our relationship with Autism Berkshire began. Um, so if I just say a couple of words about Autism Berkshire, um, we're a charity, we're over 30 years old. Um, we were originally set up by parents of autistic children and children um, with challenging behaviour, as that was the word that was appropriate at the time, um, who were looking for diagnosis and looking for more support in education. Um, because believe it or not, there were no places at schools for, for, for autistic children um, back then. And um, I spoke to a mother yesterday who has a 32-year-old autistic son who had to go to boarding school in Southampton because of his autism. There was no provision locally at all. Um, and we are very much a user-led organisation um, and we are we try to be very neuro-affirming. Um, we've campaigned a lot for improved um, facilities, resources, um, for any part of the public sector, whether it's health, education, um, sport and leisure, anything at all. Um, and back in 2016, we complained bitterly about the waiting lists the diagnosis and the lack of support when you did get a diagnosis and the NHS then turned around to us and asked us to run a pre and post diagnostic support service for children and then two years ago we were asked to expand that to cover adults as well um, and the interesting thing about working now with the adults is that we have so many parents and they might be in their 70s they might have we had somebody who was 47 and his mother came to see us about what he should be doing we kept saying but what does your son want to do and she didn't really know we said well why don't you ask him what he wants so it's very difficult sometimes to change people's attitudes um i'm a great supporter of museums um, my children were regularly taken along to museums when they were very small and i always found that the museum staff were incredibly welcoming as I said, I've got three neurodiverse children. Um, so I was absolutely delighted when we were asked back in 2018 to do some staff training for um, staff at Merle and, and Reading Museum. Uh, from that, um, they had we had our first autism friendly quiet hour session in 2019. Then of course the pandemic hit. Philippa came into our online support group. We used to call it Friday lunch break when you could just come along for a coffee and a, a chat and see how life was going. Um, and 
uh, put together the online consultation and the feedback was that quiet sessions were particularly off-putting to people. Um, a lot of autistic individuals are very sensitive to sound, as we all know, um, but, and they like frequently, they do like a quieter environment, you know, shopping centres, we have a very large shopping centre called the Oracle in Reading, but it's got those lovely marble floors, um, lots of stainless steel around, lots of glass. It's very echoey and it is really quite an unpleasant environment for lots of people. Um, but so you might want to have a quieter session, but actually a lot of autistic children are very noisy. So a quiet session, my son would, would never be quiet and he would be running for flitting from one thing to the next, to whatever was interesting for him. So that's why we changed the sessions now. And it's not just an hour. We're doing Mondays and then we've got the Saturday sessions as well. Um, we promoted the Thames Valley Autism Alert card where we work with Thames Valley Police. We've got over three and a half thousand of those cards in circulation now. They look like this. And we also have a version that says, I am autistic, because we have some people who want to be called I am autistic, and we have other people that want to have autism. So we try to identify with whatever language that they want to use. Um, it was really exciting when we got the sensory friendly breakouts spaces last year and those are available every Saturday. Um, they're also linked with the Curve, which is the big library in Slough. They have museum pods, so they're about the size of a domestic garden gazebo. Um, and then they, they've got information about the different history of Slough. Um, so they've got very small space. Um, they're incredibly good. So that was really, really exciting to be involved with that. Herschel is um, the um, astronomer um, lived in Slough and they did a fantastic um, event looking at phases of the moon using Oreo biscuits, which was rather fun. And next week, we've been invited back to do more um, autism awareness training for staff, which would be fantastic. So as you can probably um, gather from Jane's slide, really, Museums My Way has been a sort of a, a program which has developed and taken a while to develop and has definitely evolved over time and of course punctuated right in the middle by uh, COVID which of course massively changed things again. Um, so it had its origins in about 2016 to 2018 when again a collaborative partnership project between Reading Museum and the Mill was taking place and that was called Digi Reading um, and that aimed to think about how digital technologies could increase and improve access to our museums and that programme I think first um, saw was working in partnership with Autism Berkshire um, and also the Centre for Autism at the University of Reading and through that we developed some digital resources which included a sensory map and social story. Um, then we had the first if you like kind of iteration of um, an on-site activity and that was in the form of a quiet hour um, which never really took off it was a Sunday morning early before you know interactives and things went on so all of the kind of um, immersive experiences in the museum were, were switched off um, and of course that was well just didn't work as an offer um, and so when kind of COVID hit and we came back again we thought, okay let's let's revisit this what okay what what do we know didn't work and let's do more consultation to try and find an offer that would work um and then the idea of museums my way was was born out of that consultation um and since 2022 um you can see on the slide how many sessions we've run at both both sites um and how many attendees have have visited us um i suppose the main thrust or ideas behind museums my way is that they are different types of sessions so people can choose whatever approach works for them so at the mill um, we have been offering quarterly museums my way sessions between 10 and 2 um, on Mondays when the museum is usually closed to visitors we call it um, a relaxed rather than a quiet experience um, and it's relaxed just because numbers um, are capped um, so it's not a busy experience but all of the immersive and AV technologies are still available. And then at Reading Museum, um, 
uh, Lucy offers um, activities on the Saturdays, which is a bit more of an informal kind of breakout space. Um, we've since developed a badge, which kind of is an indicator of Museums My Way, which we apply to events, um, which operate in this spirit. Um, and the whole idea is that hopefully visitors can see that badge and be confident that the session has been designed with their needs in mind. Lucy's now going to just talk through some of the pledges and the um, principles behind Museums My Way. So I'll pretty much just um, read what's there, but obviously we're interested for feedback from other museums. Um, have a dedicated lead member of staff trained in neurodiversity awareness of each event or activity. Ensure that volunteers and other public facing staff are briefed in neurodiversity awareness. Provide sunflower lanyards for visitors who wish to wear one for the duration of the activity or event. Provide a social story for the venue. Provide a visual timetable for the activity or event. I think that's been really useful. Provide access to a breakout space and adult and child ear defenders. Provide access to sensory backpacks and sensory gadgets. Provide collection-based self-led and or staffed activities suitable for all ages and have a current access policy reviewed. And Is there one more at the bottom, Philippa? I can't see it. Oh, there is, Lucy, which is <laughs> review and adapt sessions to develop responsibility <laughs> to feedback. I'm so sorry, that might be my screen. <laughs> Cut off for some reason. <laughs> Fabulous. So we've got all of these principles, which are, um, which hopefully are kind of all part of our Museums My Way packages. Um, so as we said, kind of, it's very much kind of different opportunities. Um, uh, and experiences at both of the museums. So just talking through very briefly, um, Museums My Way at the Merle, um, I said we have them roughly every quarter, normally the Monday of um, the holiday periods. Um, and it's for adults um, and, and children, and it's drop-in um, between 10 and two. And that was very much that kind of need for a drop-in activity was something which came out of the Autism Berkshire consultation. Um, all activities are optional and you can visit any point within the event times. Um, but we do ask for pre-registering um, where possible, um, just so we can have an idea of numbers that would be expected. Um, so as I hinted at earlier, um, it's a chance to visit the museum in a more relaxed way, but all of our digital and immersive experiences, including our interactives and games, all remain available, but our numbers are capped. Um, We've got various resources that are available and normally stations of activities. So, um, for example, we have things like our sensory backpacks, which include ear defenders, puppets, ways of seeing resources. Um, we also have breakout spaces, um, which were recommended to us um, by Addington School, our local special educational needs school. Um, and I suppose just to flag as well that our sensory backpacks are available at all times, so they're not restricted just to the Museums My Way um, sessions. And then we also have as part of our Museums My Way normally a different theme which kind of helps inform um, object handling and investigation experiences, um, facilitated craft activities and also themed gallery trails. And we have a range of pre-visit resources available including a social story, sensory map and visual timetables. Handing over to you Lucy. Thank you. Yeah, I'm just I'm just aware that yeah, with, with three of us speaking, there's like <laughs> lots of content to go through. But essentially, we're slightly different offer on a Saturday that we're more of a drop in breakout space so that you can just enjoy visiting the museum with your with your family. But if you want to get away from what is quite a busy day, you can um, enjoy using a tent cushion, um, borrowing a sensory backpack. Yeah. So that that's sort of the aim behind ours. Fantastic. And then just moving through very, very quickly, we've got um, a range of the different resources that we offer. And Jane has kindly agreed to talk at these slides and say why they're important. Um, a lot of um, autistic individuals um, have anxiety, particularly if they haven't been to a place before or they haven't been to that sort of activity before. Um, our feedback did show that of the visitors we had, 71% had visited a museum before. So that really, that's a really big number. So people, you know, needed to know um, the sort of things that was happening. So this is just an example of the social story. 
and then we've got the um the idea here of a visual timetable using PEX cards. Um, some people use these, some people don't. Uh, my son was mainstream ability, he's got a degree now in biomedical science, but we found actually having a timetable like this, we're going to do this, then we're going to do that, are we going to do that next? That was really helpful for him. And then we've got some wonderful maps of the galleries as well coming next. So we've got a sound map, as to a lighting map, and then a touch map as well. Here's some of the feedback. And I think this is the feedback that we, I mean, we're constantly kind of capturing feedback back so that the offer evolves across um, our sites and we're being responsive. Um, and it's really flagged the importance of the partnership with Autism Berkshire in terms of reaching an audience, um, but has also really highlighted um, the need that actually the sessions have enabled people to visit museums um, in ways that they might not have been able to do before. Yeah, one of the big things that families tell us is there isn't a good place to take their children. Um, you know, shopping centres are really busy, places like swimming pools and leisure centres, they tend to be very, very noisy and overwhelming. Um, and a museum that tends to be quieter, it's ordered, it's got collections. So if your child is very interested in, a, you know, whether it's tractors or paintings or the romans things that children you know really get into that you know we have a gallery about most of the things children enjoy um so that's a fantastic opportunity for families to go out and socialize with their children um and other and meet other families as well and lucy handing over to you um yeah so the, I, I think everyone could probably read read this through okay hopefully but this was just some lovely feedback that we had um, from the breakout area um, and just how happy they were to be able to get away um, from it was essentially had become rather a difficult <laughs> a difficult visit and how they ended up staying for a few hours and, and seeing more of the museum where they wouldn't have otherwise and that that feedback obviously really helps confirm that we're hopefully going in the right direction. Um, and we're very proud in Reading of our the world's largest collection of Huntley and Palmer biscuit tins because they used to be based in town. Um, so you like a biscuit tin? We've got lots. Now, I'm very conscious of time and the need to kind of think about our lunch break, but um, so I might just scoot through the next few slides if that's okay. So. Um, we can share this presentation with Justine and the team and um, that can be shared with you, but we've got a bit more feedback. And again, it's just really important that sort of sense of um, this being a very people centric kind of programme, um, which I know has been mentioned earlier, but also we're trying our best to respond to improvements that can be made with the offer. Um, since um, over the last year, it's a, it's evolved even further. So um, for some of our public um, events um, at the Merle, we've now got My Way sessions as part of those. So for example, this one is Magical Lights My Way, which is a Christmas event in which lots of the families who attended said that they normally can't attend um, Christmas events. So this was just um, a beautiful experience. And that lovely quote there, we felt calm, regulated and full of joy. And further developments are also happening at Reading Museum. Yes, yeah, so I'll just explain why we had a big picture of a, um, an iceberg there. That's because that's our next exhibition coming up, um, up by Julian, artist Julian Greater called Arctic Mirage. And not just do museums my way breakout space, um, we wanted to commission an artist that we know, Peter Doyle, to um, create some music with neurodivergent pupils at local schools and then hopefully actually run a workshop for some of our families. So we're just in the process of commissioning that. Um, that would be lovely. And, and we obviously want to continue with our breakout space. And then we're also get, we're continually testing. So we're also gonna try um, the Merle model as well, how that works for us on a Monday um, um, when we're normally closed, just so we can talk directly to the feedback and, and, and tell them a bit more about our Saturday offer. Um, but yeah, we'll and um, just to add, we've also got the staff staff training um, coming up that we're on Monday. We're looking forward to autism Berkshire to help um because I've noticed with this conference I was it was a lot about um yeah fine I'm quite interested in looking into the staff training side a bit and the on the back of that, that we've had a few members of the team who felt brave enough to come forward and say 
than neurodivergence. So obviously I'm interested in exploring that a little bit further as well. Thanks, Philippa. Um, and the office is also development, developing with, with schools and um, we've done a lot of work with our schools partner, Addington School, um, and classes of visits to see how that kind of flexible flexible model of exploring the museum might work for their students. And just to share with you some sort of key learnings as we thought about them, we were thinking for us, for Museums My Way, that importance of working in partnership with Autism Berkshire has been absolutely significant and vital to the programme. Um, having a consistent approach to gathering data um, and a flexible evolving approach, just as our last speaker said about their work, is, has been really, really important as well. Um, and on that slide, you can also see some of the, the challenges for us obviously being very different museums, um, working in partnership, but having different parent bodies, one the university, one um, the borough council, it, you know, it off, it's, it's sort of different experiences really, um, but developing that joint offer, but differently has been really, really worthwhile. Um, and yeah, and also we're just really excited to be here today to share the approach, the Museums My Way pledges and to see if there's an appetite within this sector and if it can help in any way in terms of embedding some of this practice. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> oh, thank you so much, all three of you. Um, lots and lots of information in there, lots of case studies and examples of practice. And there's, again, lots of questions, I think, in the chat for you to go and have a look at and respond. Um, and somebody also pointed out that Leeds and Reading, you know, hey, we've got those two as our case studies.